Welcome to Philosophy in a Nutshell, a shameless spin-off of Classics Unraveled. Here we will seek the wisest of men and bring our news back to those who know nothing. I am John Christensen, and this is the part where we talk about Plato. In the previous video, we began investigating the early origins of the Western philosophical tradition, and what origins they were. We can largely discard a lot of the conclusions that folks like Parmenides and folks like Pythagoras came to, but their methods and their motivation will inform everything we talk about afterwards. In terms of the motivations of the pre-Socratics, they were trying to define our universe in metaphysical terms. They wanted to find the arche, the originating and ordering principle behind the universe. They wanted to understand how there could be both a material world of observable physical things and an immaterial world of understood and intelligible things, and whether one of those was superior or precedent to the other. They wanted to dissect the difference between a world governed by unity, of likeness, and of disunity, of unlikeness. How could things be the same and not the same at the same time? And finally, they wanted to understand to what degree the way things looked, the way we perceive things, actually reflect the truth behind those things. And as for their method, they gave us the art of logic, of mathematics, and probably most importantly for today, dialectic. The process of literally talking through truth and finding your way to better truths by dissecting each other's arguments. However, the pre-Socratics don't give us any really universal or comprehensive model for describing the universe. We really have to get away from the pre-Socratics and onto the Socratics for a truly comprehensive worldview. A discussion of the Socratic period is really a discussion of Plato more than Socrates. You see, Socrates was a real person. No true scholar really doubts that he existed. However, we don't have any writings by Socrates, and what writings we have about Socrates are actually all fictional. We have, of course, Plato himself, a student of Socrates, using Socrates as a character in his dialogues. And then you have certain opponents of Socrates, like the playwright, Aristophanes, who incorporates Socrates as a sort of intellectual villain into his plays. Clearly, if Aristophanes didn't like Socrates, he must have been around to be disliked. And therefore, we do believe he exists. But in the absence of any truly non-fictional writing by or to do with Socrates, we must rely on Plato as our lens into the Socratic world. So what about Plato? Plato was a writer of dialogues. He would create these fictional conversations between Socrates and his friends, students, and critics discussing some topic du jour, and he would inquire into the positions or viewpoints of his friends and critics and slowly show how those positions were untenable, and once they're all defeated, he would propound his own viewpoint. This method of dialectics, this reductio ad absurdum that we saw from Zeno in the previous video, was worked out in real life in the Academy of Athens, a school of philosophy founded by Plato. He would promote and expand on the Socratic method amongst his students in an actual physical school there in Athens that we will see in later videos turn into something called academic philosophy. For now, though, let's deal with Plato himself. Plato's philosophical thesis, his whole idea for understanding the universe, is formal philosophy, or the theory of forms. The forms, says Plato, are these immaterial truths that are reflected in the real world in particular physical objects. So, for example, if a person and another person are two distinct particulars, they must have something in common. And that common personhood is not just an idea, it's an actual real thing that exists in some true and in fact more true way than those two particular people somewhere in the heavens or in the ether. The fact that we can define people as people at all depends on our comprehension of that immaterial truth, of that immaterial form. And it's by investigating those immaterial forms that we're capable of defining the world we see. 
This combination of the immaterial form and the material object permits Plato to put to rest some of the conflicts of the pre-Socratics. You see, those pre-Socratics in the previous video were concerned with how a world governed by unity could permit disunity, and how a world governed by material realities could permit any immaterial realities. It's by separating those two into forms, again, the immaterial, the abstract, and objects, the material, the concrete, that we can have all of those different real elements described by those who came before in a single unified theory. Moreover, the position of forms in a higher or superior place to those of their worldly particulars, suggests a hierarchy of the immaterial above the material, suggesting that the form is in fact the arche of the Platonic method, that the forms are the originating and ordering principle of all physical reality. So what are these forms? I've already mentioned one form, the person form. Well, it's impossible to really quantify them. There's no list of forms. You see, any time you recognize a commonality between two worldly particulars, that commonality, that immaterial trait that they have in common, is the form you're looking for, right? And that is beyond number, right? There could be a water form, there's a death form, there's a truth form, there's a microphone form. Again, any time we come up with a definition, that definition is simply a description of some common trait or common reality that we're able to identify. Therefore, the goal of a Platonic philosopher is to separate the form from its objects, to figure out what makes a microphone a microphone without any reference to a particular microphone. Once you have done so, once you have identified and comprehended those immaterial truths, you are free, you are liberated from a viewpoint that depends entirely on material, physical, observation. Plato applies this methodology to a huge range of topics, be they love, or war, or the state, or the arts. But our first dialogue, the Apology, is really more a primer for how to apply the dialectical method in the real world, and a sort of introduction to the formal philosophy itself. Plato's fictional dialogue is a description of the non-fictional event of Socrates' trial. You see, the historical Socrates was accused of impiety against the gods and of corrupting the youth of Athens, and he was brought before the Athenian assembly to acquit himself of these crimes. Now, the reader would know, both ancient and modern, that Socrates was found guilty for these crimes and was executed for them. So we're not so concerned about the outcome of this trial as we are about how Socrates acquits himself in the process of the trial. Socrates defends himself against the accusation of impiety by saying that he does in fact believe in the gods, because he believes in the forms. He believes that transcendental realities govern and rule the physical world. That's a decent description of the gods. He simply rejects those tales and folklore put forward by the poets that assign to those transcendentals capricious and subjective personalities that are prone to wanton habits of lust and destruction. And he rejects the accusation of corrupting the youth by saying that it's those stories and folklore of the poets that are more likely to lead the youth of Athens into lives of corruption and debauchery. Moreover, he says that, well, I've taught a whole lot of people. If I have indeed corrupted someone, then I must have made their lives worse. Let any of those students of mine come forward and accuse me, and I'll be happy to accept the charge. But of course, no students have actually made such an accusation. It's in making these defenses that Socrates provides some of the more famous anecdotes of Platonic thought. For example, in describing why he undertook to be such an active and controversial teacher to begin with, he said it was because he received a prophecy from the Oracle at Delphi. The prophecy said that of all the men in the world, Socrates was the wisest. And Socrates, thinking this was absurd, went and tried to find all of the smartest teachers, all of the wisest men in the Greek world. But picking and prodding their arguments as he does, he slowly found that each and every one of them had inadequacies and insufficiencies in their positions. And one by one, making enemy after enemy along the way, he realized that indeed, no man in the world was wiser than he was. Not because he was particularly wise, but because he alone recognized his own foolishness. Socrates summed up his knowing ignorance in the famous aphorism, I know that I know nothing. 
In other words, that to be truly wise, one must understand that all of one's knowledge is in some way conditional, in some way depends on one's perspective and one's human limitations. In fact, Socrates says that his reductio ad absurdum, his exposing of the follies of his fellow thinkers, makes him the gadfly of Athens, the praiseworthy sting that keeps the state moving forward and prevents it from falling into any kind of complacency in its own ideas. This metaphor, of course, suggests that the philosopher is really a small and ignoble thing, but something that greater and nobler things like the state depend upon in order to not fall off the right track. And finally, perhaps the strangest part of his defense is his rejection of impiety against the gods, of disbelieving in them, by saying that he hears voices. You see, Socrates says that he is always followed by a daemon or spirit that only ever speaks to him when he is about to undertake the wrong course of action. When that happens, a little voice tells him to course correct, and he does so. This alone, Socrates claims, is what makes him special, is that he is capable of recognizing and correcting the wrong. Now, this, of course, is hand-in-hand hand with his ideas about reductio ad absurdum, of attacking error. But it will continue to be an important part of Platonic thought, especially once we move into the Christian period of Western philosophy, especially with regards to ideas about free will. And so, even though we don't get any particular thesis in the Apology, we do get a strong demonstration of the dialectical method in action, and a demonstration of how the reductio ad absurdum is not just a methodology for speaking, but a methodology for thinking. So what about a dialogue that deals with something a little bit more concrete than the method of philosophy? Perhaps the most famous of Plato's works would be The Republic, which concerns itself with the definition of justice. The dialogue begins with a conversation between Socrates and three of his companions. Socrates asks them, what is justice? And each of the three companions provides an answer to that question, all of which Socrates does not like. The first of his companions says that justice is merely giving what is owed to others. However, Socrates objects to this, saying that there are situations where giving what is owed to others is the wrong thing to do. He provides the example of someone who has lent you a sword, but when you plan to return that sword, you find that the owner is drunk. Well, if you give a sword back to someone who is not in control of themselves, then giving the sword back, giving what is owed, presents a very genuine risk of harm. In other words, a risk of injustice. The second of his companions says, okay, what about simply giving what is appropriate to other people? Again, maybe giving a sword to a drunk man is owed, but it might not be appropriate to give it to them at that time. Socrates objects to this definition as well, on the basis of rewarding friends and punishing foes. Socrates says that punishing your enemies is actually more likely to result in that enemy doing more wrong things. In other words, that the product of justice is injustice, and that's not going to work. The third companion, a fellow named Thrasymachus, says that justice is merely the most powerful man doing and getting what he wants. This is not a definition we like very much, and it's a definition that Socrates does not like very much. However, in trying to refute it, he finds that he cannot quite get around this rather troublesome definition. Now, clearly this definition of might makes right can't be correct. So Socrates says, if I can't figure out how to refute it on an individual basis, let's do so on the basis of the state. After all, what is justice but something usually worked out in the public forum? Perhaps by defining what a just society is, we can work our way down to figure out what a just individual is. And so begins the fairly entertaining process of Socrates and his companions trying to put together in their minds the ideal city-state. They gather together all of the roles and occupations they need for their society to thrive, with farmers and fishermen and guardsmen and traders, and they define the relationships between those people, with some surprising results. For example, as a little city-state becomes a big city-state, its population and that population's needs are going to grow with time. And so, Socrates says, eventually, some kind of defender, some kind of military, is going to be necessary for that civilization, not merely for defense, but for necessary expansion. However, we do not want these soldiers to merely be barbarian warlords. Again, might makes right is the thing that we're trying to avoid with this entire book. And so Socrates says that the warrior class must exist in a hierarchy that is governed by a virtuous and educated ruling class, the summit of which is the singular philosopher king. 
Socrates prescribes some rather unusual rules for this ruling class to ensure that it is brought up with no other object but the pursuit of just rulership. For example, the members of this ruling class would not know who their parents or their children are, partly because their marriages were communal, all, and partly because they were separated from their parents at birth. Awkward as this is, this meant that nobody could be part of an aristocracy. No one would be able to pass on benefits or privileges from father to son. Therefore, the only people who would rise to the highest ranks of power would be those who were truly the most qualified. At the top of this pile is the philosopher king, the eminently qualified man of justice. Or woman of justice. Socrates does make women and men equal parts of that ruling class. The philosopher king underwent an especially rigorous education that lasted most of his life, such that he was already a mature man by the time he undertook the kingly role. His education was intentionally shaped both intellectually and athletically to make him a prime specimen of both physical virtue and intellectual virtue. Most importantly, though, the education of the philosopher king was deliberately cleansed of any poetry, any stories that had the slightest whiff of vice. It was important that the philosopher king's entire upbringing, his entire environment, was characterized by virtue. Even the smallest vicious tendency was enough to corrupt the philosopher king and make him unfit for rule. And so, the necessary sacrifice of his education was that of knowledge. You see, to Socrates, the noble lie, the deliberate omission of certain truths, was necessary for justice to happen. While truth is all well and good, and a love of truth is what defines a philosopher and a philosopher king, the sacrifice one must take in order to be a good ruler, says Socrates, is the deliberate ignorance on certain topics. This willful ignorance on the part of the king was not unique to their position. Everyone from the philosopher king to the guardian class to the commoners had something that they sacrificed, something that they, on their own, rightfully ought to have, but something that they gave up as a matter of responsibility to the state. As Socrates says, the state is, well, a ship. In fact, you may have heard of this metaphor of the ship of state. It shows up a lot in ancient literature. The idea is that every member of a ship's crew is someone whose responsibility is categorically necessary for the ship's survival. And so they must perform that duty and in fact must sacrifice quite a bit in order to perform that duty in order for the ship not to break. This common sacrifice is the great equalizer of Plato's Republic. It takes the top-down monarchy of a republic and turns it into something more like the crew of a ship, where, sure, there's a captain, there are oarsmen, there are other people on the ship, all of whom have some responsibility to making sure of one goal, that the ship stays afloat. Even if one person is technically in charge of another, all of them have responsibilities, all of them make sacrifices in order to ensure that everyone makes it home in one piece. So, what skills does this crew need to keep the ship afloat? In a simple word, virtue. It's in the Republic that Plato first and best articulates the four cardinal virtues, which will become foundational to all subsequent philosophy. The four cardinal virtues are prudence, fortitude, temperance, and justice. Those on their own might not seem especially related unless we define them very carefully and very mechanically. Prudence is determining the right course of action. Fortitude would be undertaking that right course of action. Temperance would be not undertaking the wrong course of action. And finally, justice, the thing we were supposed to define in the first place, is doing all of those other things with respect to others. Justice, then, is something that depends a great deal on people's ability to tell right from wrong. And philosophically speaking, if you comprehend the form of the good, the universal good, in its non-particular sense, that permits you to recognize the good in an infinite number of particulars. In other words, it's the ability to identify the right course of action in an infinite number of crises without relying on a single, easily falsifiable dictum. It's this obvious segue from politics to philosophy, in which Plato articulates not just how formal philosophy can benefit the individual, but how it allows us to act rightly to others. This, of course, is the allegory of the cave. For those of you unfamiliar, let me paint you the picture. There are men in a cave, chained to look only at the back wall of the cave, which is illuminated by the shadows cast by three-dimensional objects. This is all that they know of the world, until one of the men is freed from his chains. He slowly but surely makes his way towards the mouth of the cave, recognizing that those two-dimensional shadows are merely cast by three-dimensional objects. And once he makes his way out into the real world, he realizes that the fire of the cave is a pale reflection of the light of the sun. 
Dazzled by what he sees, he returns to the cave and tries to present to those in the cave what the world really looks like. It is in these terms that Plato defines the philosopher's quest to illuminate the world. Those men in the cave are us, humanity. The shadows on the wall are the material world, things as they seem. And the physical objects that cast them are the formal world, the greater realities of which those shadows, the material world, is a mere copy. The metaphor is simple enough for individual purposes. The philosopher is the one who leaves the cave and emerges into the sunlight. But it is the just philosopher, or the philosopher king, who takes what he learns in the sunlit world and liberates his fellow man from the cave. Moreover, in the extended allegory of the sun, Plato equates the sun, the physical sun, with the good. In other words, if the sun is what permits us to perceive, to see physical things, it's the good that allows us to perceive immaterial things, in other words, the forms. The equation of the sun with the good might not be an obvious correlation, but it does allow us to arrive at some surprising conclusions. Most importantly, it suggests that any comprehension of the truth, any true science of the world, depends on a moral conclusion, on a recognition of right and wrong. Because it's our ability to comprehend the good, to comprehend how things ought to be, that allows us to define the real, to define how things are. Plato's theory of forms will continue to be the gold standard for Western philosophy for centuries to come, uh, up until the present day. However, that does not mean that Plato is beyond expansion. In the next video, we will discuss Plato's student, Aristotle, who builds off of Plato's foundation and expands its scope to a more broad, more practical extent. Until then, it would be prudent of you to click the like button, to exercise fortitude, but also temperance in the comment section. And it would be very just of you, of course, to subscribe to our channel. I am John Christensen. Fare thee well.